We can and should feel very sorry for many of the adults in the system. They have experienced poverty, mental illness, job loss. Many have even grown up in the foster care system themselves. But we have to ask ourselves some very hard questions. Like how long should these children have to wait before someone removes them from these dangerous situations? Good morning, I'm Pete Peterson, a very grateful Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to the Palm Plaza at Pepperdine for uh, the first in what will be a series of events and discussions under the broader title, uh, Faith and Public Policy. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary year for the School of Public Policy, and in part we are going to be celebrating through themed events a number of uh, different aspects that make the School of Public Policy here at Pepperdine so unique among America's 200 plus graduate policy programs. The 25th anniversary has given me an opportunity to look back over some of the founding documents uh, of the school. Uh, the School of Public Policy is the youngest of the four graduate schools here at Pepperdine opening its doors in the fall of 1997. And it's fair to say that even in our origins, uh, the founders of the school, uh, beginning with uh, then President David Davenport, our first dean uh, and founding dean Jim Wilburn, and uh, a number of others, including James Q. Wilson, our founding faculty and so forth, understood that in launching this new graduate policy school, in many ways we were responding to uh, many of the other then graduate schools in existence. One of the unique aspects that many of the founders were looking to inculcate in uh, the students that would go through this graduate program is that uh, an understanding and awareness that public policy was not simply something to be created in a government institution. Uh, many of the schools that do the work that we do are in fact called schools of government. And in so uh, being named, uh, there's an understanding that public policy is only the domain of our governing institutions. Uh, and in many cases, that those governing institutions are based in the nation's capital. Now, we send a number of our students and alumni into Washington, D.C. to do incredibly important work. But as is related to uh, this theme of events, there are a number of people doing incredible work in public policy through nonprofit institutions as well. And in many cases, that balance, that relationship between nonprofit institutions and governing institutions is a way of taking advantage of the freedoms and creativity that each one of these sectors, our civic sector as well as our public sector, are able to bring to bear. I wanted to quote from a piece uh, that was describing this aspect of the school uh, from 1997, our founding dean, Jim Wilburn, wrote a piece in the Los Angeles Times uh, in describing the launch of this new graduate policy school and understanding this important relationship between government and the nonprofit sector, and particularly the role of faith-based institutions in the formation of public policy and the delivery of public services. I quote from this March 18, 1997 opinion piece. Quote, a renewal of public policy should recognize that all the intermediary institutions that thrive in the space between the central government and Washington and the daily concerns of each solitary individual, our nonprofit associations, our churches and synagogues and mosques, our families, and even the private commercial sector of labor and business associations are equally critical as creators and implementers of public policy. And so today and through this series, we're going to be looking at the important policy decisions that are made and the important public services that are offered in this relationship between our governing institutions and nonprofit organizations as well, especially those that are coming from a place of faith. This first in the series of uh, faith and public policy are going to be, is going to be touching on the issue of foster care and youth services, as you know. Uh, the next two that we are planning for the year are going to be looking at homelessness 
as well as criminal justice and prison reform. And so stay tuned for those events as we schedule them. I'm delighted that we are able to bring out from uh, the New York metropolitan area our keynote speaker uh, and expert on this set of issues, Naomi Schaefer Riley. Uh, after I introduce her, she'll be offering a keynote. There'll be an opportunity for question and answer. You have question cards at your desk. Those will be sent up to me. And so we certainly welcome your engagement in conversation with Naomi. After Naomi finishes and the Q&A finishes, we'll then move to our panel and we'll be welcoming up local service providers here uh, that we looking at these issues of foster care and youth services, particularly in the Los Angeles County context. Naomi Schaefer Riley is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, focusing on issues regarding child welfare. She's a former columnist for the New York Post, as well as former editor and writer at the Wall Street Journal. She's the author of seven books, including the latest, which serves as the basis for today's event. No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists are Wrecking Young Lives. And again, um, we welcome you uh, engaging with Naomi uh, through the question cards that you find at your desk. And so without any further ado, please give a warm Pepperdine welcome to Naomi Schaefer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out today on this beautiful, amazing, landscape that I'm surrounded by. I usually just get to go to conference rooms in Washington, so this is quite a treat. Um, I want to really thank uh, uh, Dean Peterson for having me today and for engaging in an issue that I think often gets overlooked, unfortunately. Um, and I know that it is not easy uh, for any of you to decide you want to spend your free time discussing uh, child abuse, neglect, and foster care. Um, after my husband and I had our first child, he refused to actually watch any Law & Order episodes that involved child abuse. So um, if Jerry Orbach and Sam Waterston could not convince him to be interested or want to engage in this issue, I'm, I, I guess I, I'll have to give it a try. Um, so first, I want to offer you a few numbers to kind of give you an understanding of the landscape of child welfare today. Um, I am going to be touching on uh, the faith and public policy issues as well, and I'm so excited to hear from the panelists afterwards because they're doing such important work in this area. But I feel like in order to understand kind of what that work is and where it fits in, you kind of need to have a broader understanding of what child welfare in this country looks like. Um, so let me offer you a few numbers. Uh, there are about 440,000 kids who are in the foster care system today. And during the course of the year, about 600,000 children will spend some time away from their family home because they were deemed to be unsafe by a child welfare agency. There are about 2,500 child fatalities a year uh, due to abuse or neglect by a parent or caregiver in the U.S. annually. Now let me put some faces with those numbers. The first story I want to tell you is about Courtney Fantone and her mother, Claudia. They live in a six-bedroom home in Potsdam, New York, a small, relatively poor town upstate. Claudia jokes that she didn't like living alone, which is why over the years the two women cared for more than 50 foster children. Almost all those children went back to their biological families after a short period of time, with a few eventually being adopted by other families. But in August of 2016, the five Bailey children were dropped off. The fans homes told me they had never seen that level of maltreatment before. The children who were removed from their parents, removed after their parents were arrested as part of a local drug wing, were basically feral. They were all still in diapers, even the five-year-olds. They did not speak. The teeth of the oldest children had completely rotted, and it took him an hour to eat a peanut butter sandwich. Eventually, his teeth had to be removed because the rot got into his jaw. Within a few weeks, the St. Lawrence County Department of Social Services started to arrange visits with these children and their parents, who were apparently not incarcerated. The couple continued to use drugs regularly and missed most of the visits, but the plan devised by the agency was to reunify these children with their biological parents, and they were sticking with it. By the time the Bailey kids had been with Claudia and Courtney for 18 <coughs> months, the women realized that they were the only stability in these children's lives. And they made clear to the department that they would be happy to adopt all five children if the opportunity arose. The Bailey children, not surprisingly, all had acute developmental delays. But since coming to live with Claudia and Courtney, they were making some progress. The second oldest child, though, had more severe problems 
which were eventually diagnosed as reactive attachment disorder, and that caused him to want to hurt his siblings. Claudia and Courtney spent a lot of time with their children trying to prevent him from doing that. During one weekend the children spent at a respite foster home, he pushed his older brother out of a second story window. And on another occasion, he tried to stab a younger, younger sibling with an eye, in the eye with a pencil. As he grew older, Claudia and Courtney became increasingly concerned for the safety of their other children. And at one point, at a court hearing, they spoke up about the need for more intensive treatment for this child. They had taken him to a number of medical professionals who felt that he was not getting the proper care. And this apparently angered the caseworkers in St. Lawrence County, who called Claudia and Courtney to scold them for being, quote, inappropriate in court. In February 2020, three and a half years after the Fantones first took them in, the Department of Social Services served them with a 10-day notice of intent to remove all the children from their home. It has been more than 18 months now, and Claudia and Courtney still have not seen any of them. The story of the Bailey children, I think, illustrates many of the ways in which our child's welfare system is failing. In particular, it demonstrates the way the system has become oriented around the desires and the sensibilities of adults and not, unfortunately, the best interests of children. First of all, what would make anyone think that parents who had exhibited such a severe lack of concern for their children should have those children return to their custody? When we see a woman who has been beaten by her boyfriend, we don't immediately ask, how can we get them back together? But that is exactly the approach we take with child maltreatment cases. Family preservation and family reunification are the driving ideologies behind the child welfare system. Obviously, most children belong with their parents. Who could object to that idea? But the parents caught up in these kind of situations have to be in a different category. Five years of barely noticing your children's existence and failing to get them the most basic forms of medical care should preclude parents from being candidates for continued custody. We can and should feel very sorry for many of the adults in the system. They have experienced poverty, mental illness, job loss, Many have even grown up in the foster care system themselves. But we have to ask ourselves some very hard questions, like how long should these children have to wait before someone removes them from these dangerous situations? And once they are removed, how long should we give parents to clean up their acts? The Bailey children are typical in another sense too. Like the vast majority of cases in child welfare, what these children experience is what we call neglect. Though cases of physical and sexual abuse are often the ones that make the headlines, kids who were locked in the basement for years and tortured with neighbors professing they had no idea what was going on. Neglect cases are actually the ones that make up the bulk of our child welfare problems. More than three quarters of child maltreatment fatalities actually recur as a result of neglect or neglect in combination with other factors. It's not uncommon these days actually to hear people talk about how neglect is something mostly harmless. Surely it couldn't be as bad as intentionally hurting a child. But that does not jive with what we know. First, neglect statutes cover parents who leave children in the care of known abusers, give children illegal drugs, subject them to harsh corporal punishments, and fail to provide them with adequate medical care. And sometimes, crimes of omission are worse than crimes of commission. Neglect is often a sign that something else is seriously awry. Richard Gellis, who is the late head of the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Work, once told me that he and other experts mostly expected that there would be a progression of physical violence leading up to a fatal incident with a child, a black eye, a broken bone, a large bruise. But that actually wasn't the case when they looked at the data. Gallus explained it was actually a series of four or five neglect reports that predated the fatality. A child would show up at school not having bathed for weeks or not having eaten anything over the weekend. A child welfare check would find that the family's heat was off or that they had no running water. People can argue about the size of the safety net in this country but there's actually no reason that any child should be living in a house without adequate heat or enough food or water. What is standing in the way for these children are parents who are unwilling or unable to realize that something is wrong and ask for help. More often than not, unfortunately, that is the result of substance abuse. This is another instance in which the Bailey children are also typical. Our country's drug crisis is driving our child welfare crisis. In 2020 alone, more than 100,000 people died of drug overdoses. It's fashionable now to assume that drugs are harmless. In reality, though, drugs are very much a scourge, particularly in the lives of young children. In 2019, parental substance abuse was listed as a cause for a child's removal to foster care 38% of the time, a share that has risen steadily in the last decade. 
but experts suggest that this is actually probably a vast underestimate, and the real number may be closer to 80%. My interviews with foster parents suggest that there are very few cases of children in the system that don't involve substance abuse. A recent paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research found that if drug abuse had remained at 1996 levels, one and a half million fewer children would have lived away from a parent in 2015. So why is substance abuse such a big issue when it comes to raising children? Maybe the answer seems obvious, but I think it's actually worth spelling out. Before their first birthday, of course, children require an enormous amount of attention, constant feeding and changing and burping and rocking. They can't do anything for themselves. And even a few hours of parental carelessness can have grave consequences. But then children enter what I like to call, as a mother, the mobile but totally irrational stage. <laughs> they still need constant supervision to ensure that they aren't touching a hot stove or walking out the front door accidentally left open or swallowing their siblings' Legos. It is hard enough, I can tell you from personal experience, for a sober parent to monitor these situations. The other thing that we know about addiction is how hard it is to end. Child welfare agencies will offer services to parents to get them to rehabilitate. Anger management, parenting classes, or drug treatment programs. Unfortunately, it could take years for these fixes to work, and sometimes, tragically, they never do. Which brings us to the hardest and most important question about the system. How long should children have to wait? According to the Adoption and Safe Families Act, which was passed in the 1990s, when children have been in foster care for 15 of the last 22 months, the state is required to remove to sever parental rights so that agencies can work to find this child a permanent home. But as the Fantones found at each, quote, permanency hearing, the family court judge and the lawyer for the Department of Social Services put off this action. That is not at all uncommon. This law is regularly flouted, and the median length of time for a child in care is 20 months. In New York, it's 30 months. And 15% of kids in the foster care system will spend more than three years there. Family courts are operating on the timelines of adults, not children. They exist in a permanent state of bureaucratic morass. According to a 2013 report by the New York State Bar Association, more than 715,000 cases were filed in state family courts in 2011, and more than a quarter were still pending a year later. By forcing these children to wait endlessly for decisions, we are stunting their social, emotional, intellectual development, which we know, especially for young children, depends on being able to securely attach to an adult. Having a young child shuttle back and forth between a biological and a foster family or multiple foster families for years at a time can undermine their development and make life much harder for them as they grow. So what is driving this push for family preservation at all costs? The parents are seen as victims. In addition to having suffered from poverty or substance abuse, they are also suffering, we are told, from systemic racism. Indeed, it is hard to enter any kind of discussion of foster care and child welfare these days without first confronting the idea that a disparate number of black children are removed from their families by our system. This is absolutely true. Black children are investigated, substantiated, and removed at a higher rate than they are represented in the population. But what you don't hear is this. They are also overrepresented among maltreatment victims, more than twice as likely to suffer abuse or neglect as their white peers, and more than three times as likely to die as white children in this country from child maltreatment. The reasons are varied, but one is certainly the fact that family structure is not distributed evenly across the population. Children who live in homes with single mothers and non-relative males, that is a mother's boyfriend usually, are 11 times as likely to experience abuse as children living with two married parents. The mother's boyfriend problem, which is well known to sociologists and caseworkers, could stem from having to live in a home with another man's child, and black children are much more likely, unfortunately, to grow up in such homes. But instead of acknowledging this problem and then helping the children who need help, judges, caseworkers, and activists are trying to sweep this problem under the rug. Let's try a thought experiment. Imagine if we launched a lead abatement program in St. Louis next week, and we told homeowners with lead problems that they should come to us for help. At the end of the month, we looked down and noticed that black families were overrepresented among those who sought help. We would not try to take black families off this list. That would be crazy. We would assume that because they had homes in certain neighborhoods, older homes that had not been renovated, that they would need a disproportionate amount of help and we would provide it. The same should be true with child protection. If child abuse and neglect are disproportionately hurting black children, then we have to direct a disproportionate amount of our response to those families. 
perhaps just as harmful as the idea that black children should almost never be removed from their homes because of a misplaced sense of social justice, is the idea that black children who are separated from their families can only be placed with adults whose skin color matches their own. This has been the official policy of the National Association of Black Social Workers since 1972. The group prefers for black children to languish in foster care or orphanages than that they be placed for adoption with a white family. As the leaders wrote at the time, we stand firmly on the conviction that a white home is not a suitable place for black children. Only in the 1990s with the passage of something called the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act did Congress actually outlaw discrimination in the placement of children for foster care and adoption. Unfortunately, this law too was regularly flouted. During the research for this book, I regularly interviewed foster and adoptive parents who told me that caseworkers and lawyers would bring up their race during court hearings or in hushed tones outside the courtrooms. Adoption agencies regularly shame parents for adopting transracially, asking potential parents how they will handle their white privilege. They even tell these parents they are actually doing a grave harm to these children by taking him or her away from their culture. Today, there are many who would like to take us backward to repeal the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act and ensure that race is always taken into account in these placements. Just this past year, Bethany Christian Services Vice President Sherry Williams told the AP that allowing white families to adopt black children from the foster kids system can cause a lot of harm to children of color. Activists and even some judges are actually proposing something like the Indian Child Welfare Act for black children. The law puts in place lower standards for what constitutes abuse and neglect of Indian children. It allows tribes to have a say in the placement of foster children and has made it nearly impossible for any Indian child to be placed with a white family, even if no Indian family is available. Children are treated instrumentally to advance the interests and perpetuation of the tribe. And once again, the child's best interest is subverted to the adults. It's not uncommon to hear folks in the world of child welfare advocate for kinship care as the solution to the problems for foster children. When parents cannot take care of their children, the thinking goes, it would be best if they were cared for by other relatives. Again, this seems like common sense and something we would do with our own children. But this policy also seems to be applied without concern to the safety of children. The dysfunction that affects the immediate family often affects the extended family as well. Think of the story of Hillbilly Elegy, for those of you who have read the book or seen the movie. You'll recall how J.D. Vance talks about how he was saved from his mother's abusive and neglectful behavior by his grandmother, who took him to her home down the street. The story turns out well. His grandmother keeps him on the straight and narrow. He goes to the Marines and to Yale. But this grandmother who took him in would not have passed the basic background check. She herself was in an abusive marriage and had at one point doused her grandfa his grandfather in gasoline and set the man on fire. Child welfare agencies tend to have much lower standards for kin taking care of children because they will feel they will not get blamed if anything goes wrong the way they would with a non-relative caregiver. But they stretch the logic of kin care to its breaking point. Agencies take children away from non-relative foster homes, sometimes homes kids have been in for years at a time in order to place them with relatives they have never met or to live with people on the other side of the country. The rhetoric of people who favor these policies is filled with references to the evolutionary imperative of caring for people who share the same blood. I'm doubtful that this analysis extends to second cousins who have never met the child before. Non-relative foster parents, meanwhile, are treated terribly. It has been so long since the Bailey children have been able to see or speak with the only parents they have ever known. With the help of a local attorney, the Fantones filed countless injunctions and appeals to get the children back, but no luck. Their case might seem particularly egregious, but there's some aspects of it that are actually perfectly typical. Caseworkers often treat parents more like glorified teenage babysitters than adults willing to upend their lives in order to take in vulnerable children. They drop off kids at foster homes without informing foster parents about important things like a child's allergies or the fact that they have been sexually abused and may act out with other children if not properly supervised. <coughs> when people found out about my research and asked me if they should foster, I sometimes ask, would you like to spend every day at the DMV? Because the major qualification for being a foster parent is a willingness to deal with the bureaucracy. About half of foster parents in this country quit within the first year, and many who do so say that it is not the frustration that the children bring, or even the toll that this work takes on their marriage or their biological children. It is the way that they are treated by the system. It is true that some caseworkers and court staff are overwhelmed by the amount of work that they have to do. But that is no excuse for the way foster parents are treated. 
They are told by family court judges that they are not allowed to speak in the courtroom, despite laws that allow them to, and despite the fact that they are the ones who have the most contact with the children in question, who see their behavior day in and day out. When they do speak up, they can be subject to retaliation by caseworkers, and foster parents have no recourse, as Claudia and Courtley have found out. It is another reason why those of us who don't care for foster children but are concerned about their fate must speak out. But the problems for foster parents start much earlier. It's not much uncommon for foster parents to call an agency or to volunteer and never hear back. Or when they do volunteer, they find that the training won't start for months or that they're held at inconvenient times and in locations that are hours away. And the trainings themselves often involve hours of instruction about things like how many fire extinguishers you need in your home or that you shouldn't sit on a child's bed with the door closed. But there's little on how to handle a child who's recovering from trauma. In part because of all these hassles, middle-class Americans often steer clear of foster care. As Ron Richter, who's the former head of ACS in New York, told me, the system, quote, incentivizes people who don't have a job. It's like we don't want children to end up in homes with resources. And so it's not surprising that many of those who do foster end up doing it for the money. One father in New Orleans told me about how he reluctantly attended an information session for foster parents at the behest of his wife. It's usually the wife who wants to do it. By the time he left, he said he was determined to foster so that other people at the session would not. One woman asked if she could keep foster children in a different part of her house from her real children. If you wanted to create a child welfare system that focused on a child's best interests, you would place them in stable middle-class homes. It is not that poor people don't love children. The country is filled with devoted lower-income parents. But kids who have experienced trauma and are removed from their family need stability. They don't often need to be in a home where parents are stressing about whether they will make the next rent payment. Despite the fact that some parents are not up to the standards we were like, generally speaking, children are safer with foster families than in the homes they have been removed from. The median rate of reported maltreatment for children in foster care was 0.27%, which is much lower than the rate for the general population, around 1%. On the other hand, roughly a third of children who are returned to their biological parents will be maltreated again. A court-appointed panel found that 43% of children in New York who had entered the child welfare system were abused or neglected again by their families. Of all the reports of abuse of children who were in the foster care system in 2017 in New York, foster parents were the perpetrators in 19% of the maltreatment incidents. The rest were victimized during visits with their biological families. This is perhaps the most tragic part of our child welfare crisis. We know which children are in danger because the danger has been reported to us and we have either left them in those homes or taken them out briefly and put them back. We cannot claim ignorance. There will always be a need for foster families to provide a haven for these children. As long as there are children out there who are unwilling or unable to care for them, we'll have to find safe, stable, loving homes for them to stay either permanently or temporarily. What would it mean to reorient our child welfare system around the needs of children? In the past 15 years or so, there has been a revolution in foster care and adoption driven by large, mostly evangelical churches and other faith-based institutions in this country. They have changed the way we recruit foster families. They have realized that putting up a picture of a child on the nightly news was not a very effective way to find foster families. Instead, pastors have started talking to their congregations about the kids in their zip codes who need homes tonight. Second, they have changed the way training for foster care is done. They offer training in convenient times and convenient places as often as they need to. And they are doing more than telling foster families about how many fire extinguishers they need. Many are providing entire curricula in trauma-informed care. And finally, they are supporting these families, training others in the community to do respite care, asking friends and neighbors to help with building furniture, or just praying for them on this difficult journey. These communities are not only saving children, but building connections to their biological parents. Most of these kids go back to live with their family, and now those families have another source of support in their lives. The child welfare crisis is not going to be solved by churches alone. Government is always going to be involved when it comes to keeping children safe, in the same way that government will always be involved in law enforcement. The movement to abolish foster care, which seems to be gaining steam in some academic institutions, and some child welfare agencies and courts is just as impractical and as dangerous as the move to abolish the police. There are folks who want to end mandated reporting by teachers and doctors, 
who want to end drug testing of infants and no mo new mothers, and even to limit police intervention in domestic violence because it often ends in children being reported to child welfare agencies. Unfortunately, the effects of upending our child welfare system will be harder to see than the crime wave that is happening now when we defund the police. The children who suffer will stay behind closed doors. They will remain subject to the whims of parents, unwilling or unable to offer them the most basic care. And people like Courtney and Claudia will not be able to help. Thank you. Naomi, you mentioned at the end some of the steps that will be being taken to rebuild the system. If you were given, say, jurisdiction over New York system, what would be the first step that you would take in improving outcomes for kids and families? Well, I, I think I might try to tackle the problem chronologically and start with what we call the front end of the system, which is figuring out which children are most at risk. Um, one of the things that I write about in the book, which I've been really impressed with, um, is the use of predictive analytics to understand which children are most at risk. Um, so we have a lot of data actually about the families who come into contact with the child welfare system. Uh, we know, for instance, uh, if someone who has recently been released from prison is now listing back home as an address. We know if a child's been absent from school for a few weeks. Um, we know if that family has not used their uh, food stamps. Um, and, and so there's now a pilot program going on in Allegheny County, which is the area around Pittsburgh. Um, and so when a call comes in uh, reporting uh, a, a suspected case of child abuse or neglect, um, there are a bunch of data systems that sort of work together to determine how urgently we need to send someone out to see that child. Um, a lot of the situation with child welfare hotlines, um, it, it's, it's a matter of triage. I mean, uh, you know, larger cities are getting tens of thousands of calls and we're asking people to make some very difficult determinations about which children are most in need of our intervention. And so um, it seems like uh, a small thing, but actually um, affecting the kind of front end of the child welfare system using the data that we have, I think would be a very important first step. And New York is considering it. Los Angeles has actually um, experimented a little bit with this uh, as well. Um, it's, it's a very difficult process in part because you first need to have all these systems talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who's kind of familiar with different public bureaucracies knows that that is in itself a hurdle. Um, but uh, I think it's a very important place to start in terms of using the limited resources that child welfare agencies have um, to get to the kids who are most in danger. You take on the, the issue of um, the biological parents and the imperative in many systems for reuniting. Um, is there a policy step that could be taken to, in your view, rebalance that relationship between the imperative to make sure that kids are being placed in the healthiest environments versus, again, the very understandable imperative to want to reunite kids with their biological parents? Um, I think that uh, a lot of people ask me, like, are there, are there new laws we could pass that would do this? Um, I actually think it's important to take the laws that we have on the books and enforce them properly. I mean, the Adoption Safe Families Act, which I mentioned, was passed with um, bipartisan support in Congress in the 1990s. It was Democrats, Republicans, you know, some of whom are still in office. Uh, Mary, Mary Landrieu, who recently retired as senator from Louisiana. Um, Mike DeWine, who is now governor in Ohio and a few other senators got together and said, foster care is not a place that children should stay. Um, and we have to understand how important it is for these kids to have um, permanency in their lives one way or the other. And so really trying to ensure you know, foster care, the child welfare agencies are generally run by states. About half of their funding comes from the federal government. And I think we either need to put in place some carrots or sticks to ensure that the states are following these timelines. Um, there's some data I saw recently. It's, it's, it's really important to just understand um, the diminishing returns of leaving a child in the foster care system uh, after a certain number of months. If you look at past two years, the likelihood that the child is going to be unified is very small. 
Um, and a lot of judges, I think, and caseworkers feel like, well, if we just give this family a few more months, um, then it'll work out. I think if they saw some of the data and kind of understood, you know, if, if two years into this process, this family has not availed themselves of these services or you know, has not been able to get their act together, um, then you know, they would say, yes, it's important for this child to have their parental rights terminated so we can't find them to be A couple more questions, uh, and then again, we're going to be uh, moving to our follow-up panel. Um, you noted uh, towards the end of the presentation the issue of race. Um, I think a, a fair argument could be made that there are certain sensitivities that should be considered in the adopting and raising of uh, in families that are transracial. What are your thoughts about those resources and to what degree, if not a consideration on whether to place or not, but at least in supporting uh, children that are being raised in those families, should there be particular considerations there? So the first thing to understand about transracial adoption, I think this has very much been lost in the conversation, is that our largest longitudinal studies show that there's actually no difference in outcomes for children, for black children who are adopted by black families com compared with black children who are adopted by white families. Which is to say, adoption is always a traumatic event. Something terrible has to have happened for that child to be placed with a different family. Like death, abuse, whatever it is. But given those circumstances, it's really important to understand that the fact that a child's skin color does not match the skin color of their caregivers is not going to change the lifetime outcomes. And I mean education, self-esteem, everything for that child. So I think that is lost in the conversation. If uh, whether or not a family that decides to transracially adopt, you know, wants to have support in, you know, how best to raise child of another race, I think is, a, is an important conversation to have. I think what's happening now is you have a situation where a lot of these, these agencies, I mean, this, they're not, there's not a huge excess of families who are saying, yes, I want to adopt a child out of foster care, where we can say, um, look, I want to I, I wanna pick this family, and I'm going to reject these, these five families. So first of all, just understanding how the most important thing is that a child be in a safe, loving, permanent home. Um, adding things after that, you know, with regard to racial sensitivity, I think is important um, for some families, but I don't think it's the most important thing. And when that conversation, especially the way it's being framed now, seeps into the initial conversations, like I, I have friends who have adopted transracially, and literally they are made to feel like they are doing a great disservice to this child by adopting transracially. And I just, I, the message is so screwed up in my mind that I can't, um, and, it, 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 and it makes people actually question themselves. I mean, even people who really are committed to this idea that they want to adopt a child out of foster care or adopt a child transracially who has had some problems, um, nobody wants to be made to feel that they're doing a bad thing. I mean, I don't think people necessarily do foster care because they want praise from the people around them, but they certainly don't want to be criticized. Um, last question on um, this issue of parents. You raised, I, I thought, a very incisive point about uh, some of the surveys of foster parents and their exhaustion, uh, not so much with the parenting process, but just dealing with the bureaucracy. Um, are there any good models out there of what we might say cutting the red tape or easing the bureaucratic burden on parents um, and foster parents we're talking about here uh, to make it easier and more attractive for them to engage in the system? So this is actually work that a, a lot of faith-based organizations are now doing. So if you do your foster parent training through an organization like Project 127, which is based in Colorado, or The Call, which is based in Arkansas, um, what you will find is that they will assign you your own caseworker to their organization. You'll still have a caseworker with the state, um, but the caseworker for your organization will probably return your phone calls a lot more quickly. Um, they'll probably be able to give you a little bit more
more guidance about what the process is going to look like. Um, you know, they'll they'll tell you how best to interact with um, a judge or a caseworker or a biological parent, um, so that you are not um, you know subject to retaliation, or so that you know you can do what's best for the child. I mean, they have so much experience that they can really tell you what to expect and um, take away some of the surprises and also act as a kind of support system for you. So, I mean, in some sense, I don't ever expect that state governments are going to get great at that job. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard job. I do think that, you know, these caseworkers are often overwhelmed. They have too much to do. Um, and so taking the time to necessarily hold the hand of foster parents uh, who don't know what's coming down the pike um, you know, is, is a job maybe for somebody, you know, outside of the bureaucracy. I, again, don't think that's an excuse for treating foster parents badly. Um, but I do think that in terms of, you know, giving that, you know, personal touch and really sort of being able to be a support system and, and guide a parent through this process. I mean, just even something like, you know, the, the call revolutionized the way Arkansas did foster care in part because they found so many people came to them and said, I sent in my application and nobody ever called me. It's been a year and nobody ever called me. I mean, this is a state that says we don't have enough foster parents and nobody ever called them. So I, I guess, you know, some of it is just, I, I think these organizations are, can act as a model for every state, um, just as a way of kind of making this process go more smoothly. Please join me in thanking Naomi Schiffer. In part, this event would not have happened without uh, my friend Dave Klein connects involvement. Um, this all started as many good things do with Howdy uh, over burritos. And before the holidays, Dave and I uh, just caught up with one another and I learned about the amazing work that he's doing uh, and that Olive Crest is doing, that he's doing at Olive Crest, which will feature here and uh, and it was really that conversation that made me think you know we've got a I knew I wanted to have Naomi out but at the same time I wanted to have uh, this contextualized here locally as well and so Dave thank you so much for making that happen and so um, I'm gonna welcome up uh, the moderator for this next panel which we're gonna go for about 45 minutes uh, Dan Broyles uh, Dan was connect I was connected to by Dave is the care pastor of Valencia Hills Community Church and has been working at churches uh, since 2002. Previously, he was a social worker for the County of Los Angeles, where he helped children who were neglected. Mr. Broyles has a MS in Marriage and Family Therapy from Cal State Northridge. <clears throat> and in 2019, he was the recipient of the Catherine Barger Commitment to Service Award for LA County. Supervisor Barger is a friend. In fact, I know we've had alums here at the policy school working in her office and in 2021 was the recipient of the citizen of the year for the state of california by the national association of social workers please join me in welcoming pastor dan thank you so much for this privilege thank you for being here and this what's such an important issue that it affects our children it affects our next generation of kids who need love, need stability, and often uh, aren't seen sometimes in the, in the public sphere. So I'm just so thankful for this opportunity. Thank you for the, the invitation to uh, be here and hopefully stir thoughts. And I'm really just thankful for these two uh, wonderful women who I've actually known both for a number of years and just thankful to be part of the panel with them who are really on the front lines of making a difference uh, in, in this area. So I'm going to say a little bit about each of them and then they can maybe share a little bit more about themselves and I ask them a few questions personally and professionally. So I'll start out with uh, Jessica Valdez and she's been with Olive Crest since 2000. So been there for a couple of years now. Uh, has her uh, MSW degree from Long Beach uh, State and really has started to develop many of the programs at Olive Crest. Uh, it's been instrumental in doing stuff in South, Southern California. Olive Crest really has really set a standard for how to work with the faith community and the foster care community. They've been right in the middle of kind of that intersection more than I would say almost any other agency that I've known of. So Jessica's been a, a really just an amazing, amazing uh, part of that. And then uh, Dominique Robinson, who I have known now for a couple of years, 
with LA County. He's been with LA County for about 25 years or so. Almost 20. But uh, it really helps with the Faith Collaborative. That's where we work together, and we'll explain more of that later. In LA County, you know, it's the largest child care system in the country. And, uh, and so she uh, was actually selected to be UCLA's Public School Public Affairs Alumni of the Year and has done a number of projects through LA County and has really been an advocate in this area. And so and both of these, these individuals are absolutely wonderful, wonderful to, to work with. But before I jump into some of the, the questions concerning um, child welfare and foster care and youth, I'll share a little bit about what keeps you doing this work. How about we'll just start there on a little personal level so they can get to know you. What keeps you kind of doing this work? Because it's not easy work. It can be heavy emotionally. Some of the stories, as we talked about earlier, are tragic. And uh, so what keeps you doing this work year after year? Justin, you want to start out? Um, <laughs> That's correct. Yes. Okay. Please. Um, nice to be here with everyone today. Thank you so much. Um, so just real briefly uh, about myself, I um, I actually came into this work at All Press as an intern, and I didn't really know exactly what um, I was walking into. So people said, you know, I, I've met parents who have said, I wanted to be a foster parent, you know, ever since I was little. I wanted to adopt ever since I was little. Um, that wasn't exactly my story, but what I did uh, learn actually was um, the incredible work that, that all of us can do on the ground level with kids and families. And um, I realized at a younger age how important family was and how important it was for our kids to have a safe and stable system that they get to grow up in, make mistakes in, learn from, um, come back to you, uh, touch points, and all of us have had our typical adolescent years. And knowing that you come home to a safe place um, and get to learn and grow is so important. And then realizing that kids weren't getting that, um, I thought, okay, this career, I think, is going to be about families. And so that's how I started my career. I was also raised, uh, my dad was a pastor um, in the local area, and so I got to see service um, lived out on a daily basis. And so it was kind of part of the culture that I grew up in. And what keeps me going? Um, you know, it's a really interesting question because um, it's really honest to say that you get tired doing this work. It's really honest to say that you go through your own ups and downs. Um, but I look at the kids and the families that, um, that are needing support, needing services, and looking at families who are being called into this work, into the trenches of doing that, knowing that they need professionals to walk beside them, uh, knowing that it's families, healthy families, um, that are the stability of our society keep us growing and changing in all the right directions. And so I think when I see it, if part of it is just my faith and my call to action, um, my desire to see families whole um, and um, to see the kids thrive. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Domi Robinson. I'm from DCFS. I'm currently the faith-based program manager. Um, in, in thinking about uh, Dan's question, my why has changed over the years and continues to morph and evolve, to be very honest. So when I decided, when I decided to, to get into this field, I was actually completing my, my bachelor's and working in San Francisco at the Department of Human Services at the time. And uh, I was an eligibility worker for GR, or General Assistance, which is GR here, I believe. Um, and what I noticed was a common theme at that time, I was a psychology major. I noticed a common theme of my clients having been abused, neglected, physically, sexually, just a string of maltreatment um, in their lives. My clients were indigent adults. And, and because of the trend and pattern, I'm, I started saying, I want to get to these folks sooner. I want to help these, these individuals who are invisible be visible to someone, intervene sooner, to improve their, their outcomes, um, help them be productive citizens in society. So um, I decided to go ahead and, uh, with recommendation, change my major, uh, graduated from a UCLA. Um, and at that time, um, I was just coming on the heels of being a, a, a manager uh, for Five Acres, uh, a group home manager. And there I was working with a severely emotionally disturbed SCD. 
um, youth who were never going home, permanently placed there. Um, different ethnicities. And uh, my why started changing in, I want to get involved with the system and help improve it. Um, help provide better institutions and systems for children who are not able to be in a foster home. Every child is not functioning at a capacity that can be in a foster home with a single parent or two parent household. Some children have sustained trauma that require a team, that require people to be up overnight, um, that require a, a host of individuals coming together on their behalf. There is just a continuum of needs of children in the system. So I said, I want to get involved in the system and help make it better. And so that led me into going into DCFS and everyone's saying, oh my God, don't do that, don't. My mom's friends were calling and playing, like, you went to UCLA and do this, what is this about? Um, I got all kinds of feedback there. But got into the department, and was determined to be there a year and then go on. Um, really fell in love with macro level uh, social work. I really got involved uh, with uh, you know, system work in terms of increasing programs. And uh, again, my why evolved into helping improve pockets of a bureaucracy because taking that thing on is a whole nother thing. Um, but helping to improve programs and services within the department to deliver services to youth and families to help promote their quality of life in ways that I can in my capacity. And so now um, I've had been afforded the wonderful opportunity to uh, work alongside a consultant and establish the first of its kind faith-based section within DCFS. Again, we are the largest at what we do. Um, that's nothing to be proud about, but at the same time, it gives me ease because we exist and child maltreatment is real. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter the skin of your color. It doesn't matter how heavy your pockets are. It's out there. And this system needs to exist. The big thing is that it needs to be improved constantly, constantly improved. And I'm glad I'm part of that effort. Thank you. Well, why don't you, uh, Dominic, share a little bit more about the Faith Collaborative. And the, the Faith Collaborative actually started as a result of our county supervisor, and Captain Barge's office was one of the individuals, and a second one, I believe, that helped initiate that, who started this ball to start rolling down the hill to influence the faith community working better with DCFS for the sake of families and children. So do you mind sharing just a little bit of that? You've been at the front lines of that, and that's out of the box, it's creative, and it's really making a difference. Yeah, thank you. Um, in 2020, I, I was onboarded to, to help uh, establish a centralized faith-based section. In that, I uh, created a strategic framework that we call LA County Faith in Motion. There are other Faith in Motion models uh, throughout uh, California and I believe the country. However, as always, LA County is different. We've customized it to the uniqueness of our populations. We are a cultural melting pot. And within that framework, we have uh, different components and it's really multifaceted. One important component um, is that uh, the goal for it to be community led. <laughs> Historically, there's a lot of mistrust out there in the faith community, some promoted by media um, because of things that have been shared out there, things, uh, you know, child death, child fatalities, um, inconsistent, uh, inconsistent involvement uh, with the faith community. There's been different initiatives over the years that have started at DCFS that haven't been continued and why. Um, Supervisor Barger and Supervisor Solis got together and sponsored a board motion back in 2018 to say, wait a minute, the faith community has been doing this much longer than the department. Families feel safer in their churches, in their temples, in their mosques, in their synagogues. Work with them. Let's band together and partner to provide safer spaces of healing, of recovery, of reunification, of maintenance, of support. Um, and with that, we have a faith collaborative um, that we have co-led with myself. Pastor Broyles is one of the co-chairs. And we have another co-chair, Dr. Erica Holmes, um, who works very closely with me and a faith-based consultant to look at how we partner, increase, how we engage 
um, the level at which we engage the faith community to support the 20 DCFS regional offices that are throughout LA County. So we have faith-based liaisons that are designated staff in each office that work with their local faith-based community that I uh, work alongside with to look at what services can be provided. Uh, we meet quarterly with the Faith Collaborative. It's comprised of clergy, um, lay leaders, uh, other uh, members of, of faith-based organizations. We also have community-based organizations, philanthropy involved. Uh, we have more deputies that attend, as well as other external stakeholders. And everyone comes together quarterly to uh, get involved in trainings that myself and my co-chairs uh, assist me in putting together and um, look at how we can better serve children and youth. The big thing is with LA County Faith in Motion and the Faith Collaborative is outreaching to faith-based organizations and asking them what services you provide, um, what, what can we do together to better support. So there is literally a range of different services throughout LA County that are supported by our faith partners. Brandon, and how this has played itself out even in the region I live up in, in Santa Clarita is Literally this morning before I came here, I was doing training for county social workers on how to respond well to religious clients, uh, which is a really interesting thing to do with LA County. That, that, that never happens. And the two supervisors I was doing this with, they're both in there, I think, 15 or 20 years, and they said, This is the first time this has been talked about. And so because I said, you know, not all, but a high percentage of families you're helping have some <laughs> religious background. And how do you respond well to that in the midst of some differences that will come up? And so that has come as a result of being part of the faith collaborative. So, um, or even having a resource fair that um, is in our regional office. And for the first time this past fall, that actually included churches as part of the resource fair, not just mental health agencies. And so there's such a, a big gap that happens often between the faith world and the social service world. And, and that policies are absolutely essential. I'm thankful for like the policy center here and what they do. But out of policies, what works best is relationships. Uh, and so, uh, Jessica, I want to turn it over to you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about um, what do you think has been helpful to bridge the gap between what I would say the social service agencies and the faith community. Because you've been right in the middle of that and been doing that well. What would you say about that? Yeah, I think as um, a nonprofit, one of the unique things that we have been able to do is kind of be sort of that go-between. Um, Olive Crest uh, has been around since 1975, and we had our foster care contract in the 90s. And um, since I came on board in the early 2000s, one of our biggest um, strategies was how do we incorporate the church in what we do? How do we um, let the churches know what's going on? How do we call families into this work? Um, how do we support them? You know, how do we um, both, you know, both monitor how they're doing, but also build relationships with them? Um, and so I think there, it's kind of to your point, Dan, is um, the relationship building. I think it's the relationship building that we were, we've been able to do which is so exciting to see how DCFS is starting this change as well um, and giving the thumbs up to say the church is an important part of what we do. The church has to be part of the conversation. Um, and so I think being able to um, invite the churches into the story. Um, these are your kids. These are your families. These are your communities. Um, and, you know, the biggest cause of, of um, maltreatment and being involved in the foster care system is isolation. And um, so many kids and families are operating in isolation, and it just breaks down the family system. And the church is uniquely positioned uh, to be able to provide a community to people. Um, and so I think with all of Crest, um, what we've been able to show um, in general is that you can do both. That you can serve the child welfare system, that you can work within the system, you can work within the government policies and procedures, and also uh, use your faith as a guide and also call people this work um, and see that both can work together. It doesn't have to be separate. It doesn't have to be government over here and churches over here, but you can actually match your faith with the support of the work. And one of the things that, that I've seen is, and this was mentioned earlier, that 50% of foster parents quit after the first year or so. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I would add to that, I think something that was spoken about earlier, um, you know, when I heard that statistic, just the years that I've done the work, um, I, I was really happy to be able to think about our families over the last 20 years. And, you know, all of Crest is, oh gosh, the number they would have to give me the number we're using right now. But, um, you know, we facilitated over 3,000 adoptions since we got our, our license in 1998. And many, many more kids and families that we have served. Our, our statistics are very similar to the national. About 50% of our kids are go home to be reunified with their families. About 25% are adopted. Um, but what I would say is um, that statistic didn't match the families we served. Um, that statistic did not match. Our families stayed for years. Uh, we had so many families that stayed longer than one placement, longer than one adoption. Came back and said, we want to do this again. We want to do this again. Hey, I talked to my friend. They want to get involved. How do I do that? And when I realized that, I realized that there is something to um, being able to have a smaller system that our families are working with. Um, we're speaking to the large system in TCFS, um, and realizing that Olive Crest had a unique opportunity to really make it a personal involvement with, with the families, and to see that so many of these families, it wasn't a one and done. It wasn't, we tried this out, this isn't for us. It was true calling, true passion, um, and then the conviction to stay involved through the hard things. You know, our kids and families are doing hard things every day, and raising up families to do the hard things, to stay in the fight, is a really important part. I appreciate the, the comment earlier about if you want to be a foster parent, just experience the DMV. <laughs> that was uh, work with DMV, I'm sorry. Uh, offend anybody. But what I found is places of faith can be a, a great buffer for foster families because those foster parents need support. So if you ever know anybody who is fostering, those families need a lot of support. It can be overwhelming when there's trauma issues or attachment issues going on. And often, the, these wonderful families who become foster parents are lost because they don't have the support around them. And so I just think that's where places of faith can be that bridge to instead of you know, trying to recruit 50 foster families and then lose half of them just like that, to hold on to some of these wonderful foster families because they have support within their faith community, within friendships, within neighborhoods. It's just so vital. Dominic, anything you want to add to this? And just no. I, I want to just wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, you have really, really good people out there who are well-intended, but when you don't have the tools in your toolbox, like anyone who is working on something, if you don't have that wrench, that screw, whatever you need to build or create what you're doing, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to be successful. And uh, the work, is, the work with children and helping to heal, mend broken hearts of youth. <clears throat> Who've been traumatized is not easy. It's not easy within our own families. It's that much harder for children who are outside of their families dealing with that loss while they're trying to understand the pain inside them. That's coming, it's taking form in so many different ways. And so with foster parents, I would love to see legislation provide more support out there for caregivers who are interested. Um, more services that it be mandated and threaded throughout our child welfare system throughout the country and prioritized in terms of recruitment because the need's there. The need's there. Um, the faith community is a great resource for that. Um, but again, we have a lot of smaller churches. You, again, a continuum. You have small churches, you have your mega churches, you got your middle-sized churches. Um, and then you have those uh, faith partners who are interested in doing the work and would like to have a fiscal support in, in order to pull that off, in order to provide those services. So again, I think legislation tailored to the faith community to provide um, funding <laughs> um, that will help support recruitment and providing services for uh, families. And one of the things I, I continually see is you have like the faith world and the social service government world, and those worlds don't talk. They don't talk. And, and, and I'm not exaggerating when, when I say that. So in the area I live, there is a social service uh, uh, office, DCFS. I think it's about 300 employees at this one. And this is just one of the many offices. Uh, what's that? Santa Cruz office, yep. And about a mile away is a church with a once a month foster care support group for foster parents and adoptive parents. And I would say, until I bring it up, I still never met a social worker 
at that office who knows about that support group. And that's the norm. That has actually been the norm and been my experience with the need because it's like such different cultures um, and they, they're not blending, they don't even think to talk to each other and the need for collaboration really that could be a great resource for that adoptive parent who feels alone and the unique challenges of parenting an adoptive child that are, are, are unique to, to their, their neighbors. So one of the things that happens is there's a lot of assumptions that go on between I would say social service world and DCFS world and uh, even foster care and the, the faith world and so they don't really connect well or communicate much. What would you say are some of those assumptions between those literally two really significant aspects of uh, our culture and our communities? What are some assumptions they might even have about each other that sometimes aren't even accurate and sometimes there might be a little bit of truth to them, but it really gets in the way of collaboration and communication? I would like to say there's, a, there's an assumption that the faith community is going to come in and um, force feed families and um, make them make them uh, choose to become a member of of their their faith based organization, their, their church, their synagogue, their their um, body of worship, and that the only agenda is to get more members. Um, it, there's that main thing. So, would you say an assumption of motive? Assumption of motive. Um, also uh, on on uh, a part of, of the department, there's an assumption that because of certain values and beliefs within different faith-based organizations, that children will not receive the services that they need. Um, for example, um, LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, there's, uh, a of, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of assumptions going on that make the work very, very tricky but to me that much more meaningful because every child deserves support no matter what, what they've sustained, what their choices are, or what's happening in that moment in time. And every faith-based organization who's interested in supporting foster youth deserve that opportunity as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. I was thinking answering it from the, the nonprofit versus system. Um, <laughs> I switched from the church to the no problem. Um, you know, like, oh gosh, should I say this out loud? Um, so one of the assumptions is um, that, um, gosh, I've heard this one in my direct role with us, the FFA, but there's kind of an assumption that um, that our, you know, our, because we have case managers, we foster care case managers at our um, at our organization, they, they're required by the state to be master's level, so they have to be master's level in the field of social services, or therapy, things like that. Uh, the county doesn't have that requirement, um, so I, so what can be tricky is that, uh, one thing I learned early on was that uh, that social workers in the county, uh, wonderful people, um, they're not necessarily uh, trained in social work, so sometimes they have bachelor's degrees, sometimes they have other degrees that are coming in. And so one thing that nonprofits were able to, by state law, it's interesting, is that we have to have master's degree to do this work. Um, and so there was some assumptions that um, we get paid um, a lot more money to, uh, to do work. And, um, and I was surprised how often that would come up in the way that we were talked about as an agency um, or the work that we were asked to do. They, well, they can do it, they can do it, we should always do it, they get all the money. Um, and it, it was unfortunate because it, it was something that um, when I asked someone one time at DCFS, because it's not true, I asked someone sometime at DCFS, where did this come from? And she, at the time, had just said, we can't fix it. It's continuously being talked about through the ranks. We can't, we can't, uh, we can't seem to, to make, it, make it stop. And so it was interesting how, how the collaborations of those two, whether you were, you know, because we have to work very closely with the county workers, um, that there was that assumption. And what people didn't realize was, uh, while we have a lot higher regulations in the work that we do, we actually um, our funding is very low. And um, my staff do a lot um, for what that assumption was. And um, the assumption, while we had lower caseloads, which is also true, um, we have to see the kids more frequently, and we're audited more frequently. And so what I saw over the years was um, a disconnect between understanding um, that both played a very, very important role and were equally responsible for the work that they needed to do. Um, and I was
was surprised how often it came up. Um, and it was something I wish I could change uh, because both both parties were moving equally. Well, just because just we have a, a couple more minutes, is there anything either one of you like just to share about um, the foster care world that maybe the average person out there doesn't really understand or maybe there's a misunderstanding out there or just something that you're really good to clarify. When you talk to your friends and family, they don't get this about the foster care system and what it represents, whether it's in the county or foster care agencies. Like, I really wish I could put this on a banner somewhere about caring for kids and what's needed in the foster care world. Um, it, for one, I want to say in front of everyone, this individual here moderating this panel is phenomenal. He's a game changer. Um, and I was uh, just sitting here thinking about how he's come in with DCFS with prior, with prior experience and um, as a social worker and now, um, you know, coming as, as a DCFS faith partner, he understands the layered complexities of the bureaucracy. And so he's assisted me in navigating some, you know, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, difficult waters. And so, for example, he did mention that he's come in and um, he's working in SPA 2 uh, through our Santa Clarita office and bringing faith into the regional office in terms of um, helping social workers understand the importance of faith. Um, and how they are a valued entity at the table and that their voice has a lot of weight in making long-term monumental change and outcome for families. Um, initially, we were thinking really big and having um, the academy uh, that brings in all social workers like revamped, redesigned to integrate faith. And then, you know, after doing some research, we said, oh, we better start with pilot. And so uh, he took on um, starting this effort in SPA 2, and there has been great, great strides made there. Hopefully, the hope and the goal is for faith um, to become a fundamental part of training, and so that um, all of our social workers understand uh, that faith partners are available, who they are for every respective office, um, every area um, of all denominations, and faiths. What I didn't mention is there's a huge interfaith effort uh, woven into the LA County Faith in Motion. And so what was on our side was the pandemic. So if I can say that was a huge positive with the pandemic. Right after I was onboarded, the pandemic came. I was onboarded uh, in uh, early February and then the pandemic hit in March and then we had to really you know, strategize. And what happened was you had folks from different faiths coming all together saying, oh my God, we need each other. How do we do this? Um, it wasn't about what, what my ideology was, what my belief system is. It was all about love and care and safety. And that theme, um, that culture that was birthed during that time has really helped move this work this work forward. So I just want uh, to really highlight um, that we have different different individuals who otherwise would be in their own siloed areas coming together and making sure families of all different backgrounds, of all different ethnicities are able to receive services in ways and from faith organizations that make sense to them, that make them feel comfortable and make them feel whole. So it's a really great time in the department for faith and I am absolutely excited to be working alongside this individual over here today. Thank you, thank you, it's very, very kind of you. Uh, a real quick, quick story before Jessica shares, I was doing a training with about 100 therapists psychologists and licensed social workers and I said to them so how many of you are really comfortable talking with your clients about uh, their their culture of course of course how many of you are comfortable you know about their sexuality oh yes we're safe people how many are comfortable talking about people's faith story crickets it was awkward as can we you know that, that thing you don't talk about at, at the holidays is what religion and what Politics, right? And that is kind of leaked into even the professional world. I said the very awkwardness that we're all feeling now is what clients often feel when they bring up their faith. 
and they can really feel that. So how do we integrate the whole person when we think of social work and uh, policy? All right, last, I can say more about that, but I'm going to have Jessica share. Any last thing you wish you, you could just share um, about the whole foster care system or some misunderstandings out there about children in need? Yeah, um, our kids are just kids. And um, I think when people ask, uh, people will say to me about becoming a foster parent or getting involved, and they say, well, I don't think I can do it because it's going to hurt too much. And what I've always said to them is I said, well, if it hurts, that means you've done it right. And what I mean by that is we don't hold anything back. And we give our kids everything that they deserve for them to be healed and whole. And if we have to let go, then we know that if it hurt, that we gave everything that we had. And um, I think as adults that are looking to how do we change policy and how do we get involved in a micro level or maybe a larger level, um, I think the question is, you know, how do we serve our kids and families better? And, um, and how do we remove the barriers to making this work doable for families that are stepping up to do it, for churches who are filling in the gaps? Uh, one thing I was mentioning earlier was, um, I'm proud of the, the organization I work for, and there are many wonderful organizations that are out there. Um, one thing I can say, though, is we can't do it by ourselves. And um, having been a director for a few years, realizing that um, the church could uniquely step in. And then when I was looking at getting the church involved, I saw all these barriers to ways that even volunteers could work with our kids. And I thought, this can't be. This can't be the way that we are our you know, all these wonderful people that want to step up, how do we remove the barriers that are there for them to just be the church, just to be the community, just to love all these kids and families and support them? Um, and and so when I talk to, you know, obviously students who are looking at policy, that's one question I say, how do we remove the barriers for people to be the people that people need them to be, to be the community that they need them to be? Um, and then in addition to that, um, just in, in looking for... Um, the system needs people who care. The system is a system. It is broken. It will always be broken. Um, when I tell my staff that when they get frustrated with the way that the courts make decisions or the ways that um, policies don't work out the way they wish they would, um, I've said from my perspective, the system is broken. And it's broken because we live in a broken world and that's never going to be fully fixed. But it's the work that we do inside of that system. It's what we bring to it every day. It's what the small changes that we make that make the difference. Um, and so I would just say, um, one question I have for people is, you know, just asking about your calling. You know, is it a call to do this work? And what are you gifted with? It doesn't have to be foster parenting. Um, I think that's one thing we talk about with the impact on the system is, is not just one way to get involved. Um, and the question is, you know, everyone can do something. What are the things that were you really called to do? Um, and I think that is what's gonna change the system. Thank you both so much. Why don't you give them a hand? So um, we've got a couple minutes for questions, um, but I know they're uh, very uh, grateful that um, these folks are going to be able to end Naomi just for a little bit for uh, maybe some one-on-ones. Um, do we have a couple questions from the audience? So I just want our panel and our speaker to know that Pepperdine has a foster program here on campus. And it's called the Rising Scholars. We're a two-tier program in that uh, we work with the states and so the, the social side of it. And I love, I love knowing that the faith base is working with them as well. Because what we do is we do get the legal documentation that shows they were in the system. If that student ages out of the foster system, then we provide them the services here as well as the loan forgiveness. And if uh, the student was in the foster system for a day or five years, but they were adopted out, went back to home, then they get services in our system. What makes our system, what makes our program so unique is that it's all five schools. So our oldest foster, he is 49 years old, getting his doctorate in your vice principal at an elementary school. And when he found out we had a safe place for him to be part where he had a community of foster, he he has, they are able to speak amongst foster students. We have 25 in our program this year between all five schools. And we meet once a week at the beginning of every semester. And if, if 
partner with RISE, and we're providing programming, providing more and more services every year. Um, but I just want to put that out there that Pepperdine is a destination for foster youth, and that we would love to partner, and that Tammy is part of the, you know, um, RISE, the official name is their program? Raising Hope. Raising Hope. And she also happens to partner with me and helps me identify the legal documentation. So sometimes I don't know how to decipher it, and she will help me decipher it. So we do have that here. I want you guys to know that. And I would love to hear from you so that I can partner with you to, to let those young people know they have a place that's safe here in the community, here on campus, of many people who want to just love on them as well as young adults. Older. Well, we'll make sure you, you connect after. I'll, I'm just going to ask, just in the interest of time, a closing question on behalf of students and for both all three of you. Um, you know, we're a master's in public policy program, and our kids, I think, many of whom are very gifted um, quantitatively in policy analysis. And we heard from the keynote the importance of data analysis is becoming an increasing part of uh, supporting foster. Uh, systems. Um, first to you, Dominique, if I were a student that, given the conversation today, have become very interested in pursuing opportunities to use my degree in supporting the foster system, how might I do that? I would encourage you to schedule time with me so we can speak about it more for one. <laughs> to make sure that you're well informed. What's really important is for you to have the information you need to make the best decisions. Um, I would strongly suggest um, getting into macro level social work where you're actually working um, and impacting systems. Um, and if you are so brave, I would suggest working at DCFS at least a year. You can go in, into it with a time limited mind frame. Once you work at DCFS, you can absolutely run the country, I'm telling you, <laughs> with the skill set that you get. Um, and you get so much exposure in terms of policy. You get exposure in terms of practice, um, and if you learn how to do biopsycho social assessments, like in your sleep, you can do it, as well as being able to navigate in um, the world of whether it be government, whether it be private, whether it be a public or the nonprofit sector, and uh, really know how to create services and programs that, that advocate and build and rebuild healthier people and healthier. Yeah, I, I just want to just so echo that. I think that's actually wonderful advice to jump in to whether it's working for DCFS or just being a foster parent, like jump into the middle of it. Um, I think we've all encountered individuals who have a lot of advice but not the experience, and it's a frustrating conversation. It's kind of like anybody here who's had uh, someone come up to you and give you parenting advice and they've never met your kid. <laughs> right? And you're like, a courteous smile, like thank you. Um, so I just think that's absolutely wonderful. I jump in somehow, some way, kind of full feet, just to, to be part of that because it will really affect your lens and affect the, the questions you ask. I think that's wonderful. Jessica, anything you want? Yeah, I was just gonna um, add, and that was a beautiful quote, um, answer. So well, I think on a on a, a level when I was um. I had the opportunity to go to Sacramento um, with some policy work and just to be part of a work group. And I'm so grateful that the state had wanted to hear from us in some policy development. Um, but to, her, to Dominique's point, uh, I, was, I was also very surprised at um, when the policies were being constructed, what we kind of had to explain. Um, and that it made me very nervous <laughs> to realize that sometimes those that are working on policy um, are missing some of the story and so I would agree with what I said that any ways that you can get involved to learn more about that from the ground level is, is hugely important and I would also say if you choose to do that um, one thing I would love to see is policy around making foster parenting um, more doable for our families um, a little less feeling like a uh, like a regulated group home in a lot of ways um, feeling like they're constantly being scrutinized and really giving them the honor they deserve and also letting them um, 
have a home that's a home for these kids, um, not just feeling like there's constant regulations that they're trying not to do something wrong. Uh, ways that we can help them, their job's hard enough, and ways that we can help them uh, to reduce some of that, that end of stress. Um, I would love more policy work around that. Please join me in thanking our panel. Well, thank you all for joining us again. This is just the first in what will be a three-part uh, series this year uh, on faith and public policy. Next, we'll be taking on homelessness and excited to uh, explore that in many, in much a similar way as we have today. Uh, this is our 25th anniversary as a policy school, and uh, in that, we're really excited to continue to open up a, a variety of different events and speaker series. I know if you've registered here, I know we had some drop-ins, uh, which are always welcome, but if you registered, you're already on our email list, so that's great. But if you dropped in, would like to know more about what the policy school is doing, uh, please reach out or stop by the table to make sure that we have your email address and we can keep you updated on future events. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. And I know we have some prayers in this room. Uh, we've got some amazing public servants here, as I think we've all heard from, um, that are doing that work, both on the public sector side and also the civic sector side. And it's such a crucial set of policy issues and personal issues. Uh, so I'd ask that you uh, continue to pray for them as they do this crucial work. Thanks again.